Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, where scientists and engineers come together to chat about common interests, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Antonia and I'm joined by Jasmine, Alistair and Sophie to talk about university and how useful it was for getting us to where we are now. We have an audience from the EDT joining us and we'll be answering their questions via a live Q&A chat. This audience is here on their Insights University course, so that's why we've created this episode that we have. So, Jasmine, what are you doing currently and how did you get there? So I'm a postdoc, which means I have a PhD and do research at university. I work at Imperial and do research in the environmental impacts of different decarbonisation pathways for net zero. And basically, I got to where I am because I have basically, I went to university and decided I want to stay forever and ever and ever. So I did my undergrad, (laughs) then went straight into a PhD and then went into a postdoc. I did most my undergrad and my PhD at the same university, University of Manchester, which is where I know Antonia from. And then I got my postdoc pretty much immediately after my PhD at Imperial. And I've been here ever since. (laughs) That's great, Jasmine. And it is really funny because we were in the same research group. So some of my background will line up with Jasmine. But um, Alistair, you have a different background to most of us. Yeah, sure. I'm doing a startup with Sophie called Carbon Neutral Fuels. And the idea is that we want to suck CO2 out of the air and recycle it into low carbon fuels to try and decarbonize industries like aviation and long distance transport, where batteries are a bit too heavy. And uh, how I got here was a bit of a strange journey in that um, I studied computer science at Imperial. And then after that, I started a cloud computing company, which I did for 15 years. But I was always interested in energy and climate change. And um, so I I sold my previous company and I was fortunate to meet Sophie at COP26. And and we spoke about saving the planet. And uh, then we we decided to start the company. I love that story (laughs) because, you know, you, you hear about conferences and going to them and, you know, you wonder what action comes out of it. So it's great that, you know, we have this um, company come out of it. So Sophie, if you could talk about uh, your background. Sure. Yes. My background is chemistry. Um, I went to University of Manchester after college and spent a glorious three years there having a really grand time learning about all things electrons and also all things like how to pay an electricity bill, um, which is really great. Um, <laughs> I then went to work in the nuclear industry, which again was really interesting, quite different, but applying that chemistry side, but found that actually, whilst I loved the science and the lab based side of it, actually my, my energies lay more in wanting to work on climate change specifically and within that in a startup environment, which was amazing when Alistair got in touch and said, I've got this crazy idea. Do you fancy giving it a go? So um, <laughs> left left the industry a couple of years ago and I've been working in sustainability and climate change ever since, which has been really fascinating. Um, but we obviously went to Manchester too, Antonia. So what's your background? Yeah, so I started, well, I actually, here's, here's some insight to university. I didn't get into university first time. I didn't make my grades, so I had to go for clearing and I went on to a foundation year for my degree, chemical engineering. Um, I did that because I had options to do chemistry like Sophie and we might have met, but um, I instead stuck to my original uh, degree choice and did an extra year, met lovely people and eventually I did meet Sophie through friends. (laughs) It was always in the stars. Yeah, it was It was meant to be. We were supposed to meet eventually. And then I spent a bit of time doing a postdoc, uh, po- not postdoc, sorry, postgraduate research. And then I found a job in energy management. So I'm a consultant helping companies reduce their energy usage and to be more sustainable. So I've uh, also achieved my, my dream of trying to help the planet as well. Do you ever look back and think, I should have done chemistry? No, I don't, actually. I'm really pleased that I didn't choose chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would be your pitch to uh, convince me to do chemistry, Sophie? Oh, gosh. Do you know, I, I really loved doing it, actually, because I, I did three topics at A-level. I did chemistry, French, and maths, and then thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And it was, I, I think when you're when you're in the midst of it, it feels like such a big decision that you have to make. 
and I actually originally started applying for geography because I thought oh, I'm not good enough to do any of those um, but I really love the natural world and maybe I could give that a go and try something different but it actually worked out quite well um, doing chemistry so I would say if maybe I wouldn't try and convert your mind controversially I'd just say go for what you want to do follow your energies and mine happened to be chemistry Oh, I'm happy because I I really wanted something applied. I think I liked that aspect. I didn't realise how technical engineering was uh, until I was in it and how much physics is involved. But I'm I'm glad I did it because it's kind of that direct link into the real world, the, the world that we see, basically. Yeah, contrary to the name, chemical engineering isn't really engineering or chemistry. We did one module on chemistry in first year and that was it. The rest was just physics and maths. Yes. Yeah, we were having to do a lot of chemical engineering in our um, uh, new startup, and uh, I've I've been having to learn all about it, which has been quite interesting given my uh, computer science background. But I, I still remember a huge amount of, of my chemistry from high school because uh, I was fortunate that we had some really great physics and chemistry teachers, and um, that was my big interest was was physics and, and chemistry. Um, I was denied doing biology because my, my parents insisted that I do uh, a second language, and I was made to be German. <laughs> And uh, I, I don't remember any of it, but I'm pretty sure if I'd done biology, I would have remembered all of it. <laughs> um, so if, if, if your parents try and make you do something you don't want to do, try and convince them that you're just not going to remember it. Yeah. <laughs> that is a great bit of advice. <laughs> yeah, I think it's about like finding what you are drawn to, but also what you're good at as well, isn't it? Yeah, and I think at uni, sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're there to, to learn and to, to be part of a, a sort of growing knowledge base. And that's really exciting. But actually, it's all the other sort of outside worldly skills that you can pick up and you can learn. I mentioned learning how to pay an electricity bill, living by yourself. Um, we spoke a bit before this podcast, Antonia, about different um, hobbies and organizations that you can get involved with and how yes. actually they're really a big part of your whole experience yeah I really enjoyed being part of student societies I got a bit of leadership experience by running a society also doing some events organizing and that's when you learn some other skills but also trying to figure out how can I develop more skills basically and what can I apply that's related to to what I study but also try and link it to to the wider world so that was really good and I made loads of friends Sophie I met via via friend of a friend and same with Laura actually we were also friend of a friend that I met through the society engineers about borders so yeah I think I had a lot of good sort of side experiences to the studying and I think Alistair you said you you also did something really <laughs> different. Well, I, I was quite shy and I um, nobody told me that you have at the start of university, everyone's kind of meeting each other. And that's when your friendships will form for the rest of the time that you're at university. And that sort of uh, freshers week where all the societies are advertising um, what they're providing, I'd say get involved as much as you can. And if you're shy, um just try and overcome it and just put yourself out there and, and go and um, join these things because uh, I, I kind of regret that I didn't. But I did end up making friends with somebody on my course who had started a business in his secondary school um, selling uh, web hosting online. And uh, I knew nothing about setting up businesses. And um, I had no idea it was so easy in that like somebody who's 15 or 16 years old can just register a company on companieshouse.gov.uk <laughs> and and off you go and and it's incredibly easy and so I learned about business and I learned about web hosting and that's ultimately what I ended up doing after university and I, I started my own company and um and grew that and and we grew to 25 people and we had offices in in Old Street in London and um some of our clients included like SoundCloud um, before they grew too big for us because they, they're, they're a huge um, company now, SoundCloud. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of fun doing it. And um, that's how I ended up doing computing was that, that despite my love for science and engineering, um, 
computing and the internet in particular in the 90s was taking off and I was going to university around the year 2000 and it was really topical and it was really exciting and I think timing can play a big role as well so if there's, there's various trends that are happening like AI is pretty hot right now sometimes it can make sense to to jump on a on a trend and if you can combine you know science and and a hobby that's also quite valuable as well because you'll have passion for it. Uh, we've got a question in the Q&A. So someone's saying that they've, they're having trouble picking between material science and chemical engineering. So between me and you, Antonia, we, we got this. Maybe Sophie. <laughs> well, I was going to say, how did you choose your degree? Because I actually did kind of consider material science. Well, I knew I wanted to do an engineering subject. So for background context, my family is academic. So my dad is a mechanical engineer. My mum worked at university in China before we came to the UK, but she was more in like the language department. Uh, so I had already had exposure to engineering, so I already knew that I wanted to go into an engineering discipline, but not the one that my dad is in, because basically my dad, because he's been, he was at University of Manchester, formerly known as UMIST, for decades. So he knew people, so basically I didn't, I wanted to be in an engineering department where my dad couldn't spy on me. <laughs> <laughs> was basically how I came up with chemical engineering. Brilliant. That's quite a unique case though, isn't it? Yeah. That you want to avoid a certain department because your parents are in it. Yeah. Did you know that my dad actually knew my A-level results before I did? Wonderful. Yeah. To pick up on what Alistair was saying, when choosing your degree, a useful exercise might be just to look on job websites and look at job descriptions and things like that. Because if there's something that picks your interest, um, you can almost work backwards and say, right, I'm really interested mm. in sustainability, for instance. So again, material science isn't my bag, but um, Laura's put in the chat about things that you, you can look into battery technology and making things more efficient. And that's all in the sustainability realm, which is a really big uh, point of interest at the moment. So I would definitely recommend looking at future jobs Looking on LinkedIn is an absolute must because there are so many great people out there and so many interesting things. So just doing a bit of research can really help inform that decision. But uh, going back to the pros and cons of material science versus chem eng, I mean, it depends on like what you're personally into because they're both quite different subjects. So chemical engineering is more process engineering. So you're designing the processes to make things. So to make chemicals or fuels or like even food... Uh, that's chemical engineering. Materials science is more like you're looking at developing materials more rather than the, the process of like manufacturing things. Yeah. So that that was basically why I chose chemical engineering was I knew I was interested in physics and chemistry. Material science came up, materials engineering came up, chemical engineering came up. And yeah, for me, it was the difference between looking in a microscope at materials and seeing if it's a better or worse uh, chemical or material. And there's value in that because everything we need is an engineered material. We, you know, there, there's lots of things that go into even what we think is simple, um, like a table. It's not just wood. It's got it's got materials to cover it, so it's got a smooth surface, you know, the way we treat it. There's all, all these aspects. Um, and I guess I wanted to see, you know, I see a lot of new technologies, but the struggle is getting them to scale. And then there's lots of waste once you've started making it. So I wanted to sort of tackle that problem. Uh, Alice, there's a question for you. So they're asking, like, how fuels are tested. So we're quite an early stage startup. And we're still doing the design work. And um, that's kind of done predominantly on computers and offices. And we've, we've got an engineering uh, company that's helping us um, design our first e-fuels plant. Um, testing of the fuel is something that we'll need to do. And there are companies that, that focus on um, our first product will be jet fuel. Hopefully we're going to make synthetic kerosene and uh, there's an interesting problem with synthetic kerosene in that it's um, it's very pure as a product, so it has straight chain hydrocarbons, whereas fossil fuel derived kerosene is quite dirty and it contains impurities like sulfur and aromatic compounds. And um, what's actually happened is that the 
jet engines have been designed to use the dirty fuel and um, the seals and the, the way it works depend on aromatic compounds and things. So we can't put 100% of our fuel into a jet engine. Um, the plane would fall out of the sky, apparently. <laughs> but we can blend it up to um, 50% uh, at the moment. And certainly um, uh, jet engine manufacturers like Rolls-Royce have testing labs and things. So once we get to that stage, the, the plan is to send our, our fuel off to be tested and hopefully they'll give it a thumbs up. <laughs> It's a fascinating world. There's, 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 you just wouldn't think that making a better fuel would actually be a problem. You'd think it would be a good thing, but um, the, the world is a strange and uh, messy place at times. Yeah, I, I love that because also the way we got there was because we inherently have this impurity, so why don't we make use of it? And now we're trying to go the other way. It is, it is a funny world, isn't it? It is. Sophie, did we cover why you wanted to do chemistry? I didn't really know what else I was going to do. So it's not a very good um, (laughs) motivating story. But I think sometimes when you have all of these decisions to make, it is sometimes best to just go, I quite like this topic. I can jump in and I'll give it a go. Because you actually don't know what's going to come out, out the other side. I would never have expected, having done three years doing chemistry in a lab I would suddenly be working with Alistair on helping to solve climate change you just sometimes don't make those connections so I would maybe say if you are in the midst of a big bubble of chaos and you don't really know what you're going to do it is totally okay to just say I quite like this and I'm going to see where it takes me because a lot about uni is about having those connections and not even uni perhaps just about growing up and having experiences about making connections being authentic working out where your energies lie and sometimes we haven't really explored the concept of a gap year or anything like that but sometimes it's okay to just take a pause and to go and work out where you want to be so I don't necessarily have the best intro into chemistry story but I think it's got me into a good place. I think that that's quite common though that a lot of people don't know what they want to do and they kind of go with well I know this is a topic Um, So I had no idea that chemical engineering existed until I was looking for courses at university. I never really knew about the field of engineering. So I actually went on EDT courses. um, And that's why I kind of wanted to, to, you know, work with this on the podcast was because they helped me understand the different, uh, you know, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, um, and and all sorts. Um, So for me that you know as well as finding what your what your energies lie is find out where it doesn't lie absolutely <laughs> so like go go to those sessions find out and ask those people what do they do and then i i actually thought the at a careers event i thought the chemical engineers were the most boring people i spoke to that day but you know sometimes your first impression is wrong <laughs> That's true. Did you ever feel like you had any barriers or hurdles in terms of once you'd made your mind up on chemical engineering, was there ever a a sticking point that might have put you off? There were some. There were some that like people said, have you considered a less dirty um, career? Like Because the, the picture is, is a chemical engineer works on a oil and gas rig. That's petroleum engineering, not chemical engineering. But some chemical engineers do that. Yeah. So some people sort of wanted to check how um, motivated I was. There might have been some gender bias playing into there. There were also like, you know, family saying, oh, you're good at science, then why not do medicine? Because it's well paid. But it just wasn't my interest. And actually, the amount of work you have to do, it's very like valuable for society but for me personally I wouldn't have been able to make it (laughs) through all that. Someone's asking if in our university degrees and courses if we were able to choose modules that relate to interests in climate change that really depends on the course that you do and also the university so some courses universities you do have optional modules but for others you don't get that choice so Antonia when we did ChemEng do we have options? Oh yeah, mine was chemical engineering with energy and environment actually. Yeah, I had a choice in second year and then like my final year was quite directed. 
Yeah, I did chem ecology with environmental technologies. Minus the water course. Yeah, minus the water course, which I still think is very useful because a lot of chemical engineers actually do end up working in wastewater treatment or in water purification. Or a lot of chemical plants or, or other manufacturing plants have their own waste tr- water treatment on site because they need purer water for whatever they're doing. So like Antonio did, apparently I didn't. Uh, I know that at Imperial in the undergrad courses they do have options in their third and fourth year. So similar with the MSCs, they have options. Sophie, what about you in chemistry? Did you have options? Oh yeah, massively. Yeah, massively we did. Um, green chemistry, all of those sorts of things. I think it's great that you know that you want to work in climate change, the person that posted that question because that's something that Alistair and I are looking into now is well, as we grow our team and as we grow our business what sort of people are we going to look to bring on board and that sort of angle of climate change and sustainable engineering sustainable chemistry um, is is really important but I think Alistair's story is really interesting because it shows that whilst you might have choice at university actually you can do things after university that influence where you now are working yeah it's it, life is seldom a, a linear path from, <laughs> from start to to end it's all, you often go off on these these tangents and um uh i i didn't study uh well i studied computer science but i didn't study the the, the real science and um Something that was an optional module when I was studying computer science was AI. Mm. And had I chosen to do that, there would have been a, a, a dark period where there wasn't much going on in AI. <laughs> Obviously, now AI has completely taken taken off. So timing can be um, can be an interesting one as well. And I think climate change is definitely something that over the next 10, 15, 20 years is, is going to be very important. And um, there's going to be a lot of careers in it. And there's going to be a huge transition away from fossil fuels and and um, the burning of things to, you know, renewables and um, alternative fuels and things. So it's it's quite an exciting space to be in, and um, there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity there. For a perspective of uh, one of our other podcast members, who is a lecturer in civil engineering, there is a lot of sustainable civil engineering um, going into the course that she teaches. So it isn't just limited to, you know, in a sense like chemistry, chemical engineering, it, it can it can expand because, you know, if you think about where where climate change could affect and what it could do, we've got a, you know, it's almost like resilience against climate change, technologies to prevent climate change or turn reverse the effects of climate change. So uh, or even economic effects of climate change. So there is there is all sorts of aspects that uh, the topic could touch yeah business school in imperial who are also my neighbors like they do they have like one side that do like research into like economics of climate change mm. yeah and uh, i'd also add technically i don't think it's really stem counts as stem but my friend that's an architect they're finding that a lot of their clients they want like more sustainability in the in the design so there's a lot of like reusing repurposing in more concepts and, and designs so that's even something that i'm teaching some of my clients is, you know, I'm talking to their procurement teams and supply chain analysts to to understand how do they choose more sustainable raw materials or how do they understand how the people that they work with are being more sustainable. So it, it really is, you know, touching every aspect of life. Someone's asking if we can talk about the research projects that we've worked on. So I guess this would be like both at uni, but also maybe also stuff we've worked on post uni Sophie Alistair I don't think I've I've done any hard research at the moment we're doing our first feasibility study into our first e-fuels plant and and that's a piece of research uh, I suppose but but between now and, and university um not so much Sophie did you did you work on any I did and they have all left my head which is wholly unhelpful for this. But I think it probably goes to show that university is very important, but sometimes it's not where your true passions lie, I would say. I just thought of something and um, I did personal research into nuclear energy for 10 years because I found it interesting. And I kind of found, I wanted to to solve climate change in my head and, and I looked at renewables and I saw they were intermittent and and I, I just followed breadcrumbs and I arrived at nuclear and seemed to have 
um, the way we were doing it before had challenges, and I found some new exciting ways of doing nuclear, like molten salt reactors. And I ended up going to conferences over 10 years, and that was actually how I ended up at COP26. And that kind of research into something that I found fascinating did lead me to ultimately setting up carbon neutral fuels and carbon neutral fuels doesn't today have anything to do with nuclear but through that 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 world that I was interested in I did learn about um, synthetic fuels because a lot of people in the nuclear space are saying well we have a huge source of energy here you need energy to make alternative fuels maybe there's a a, a tie in there and I thought oh synthetic fuels what's that um, and, and that was through YouTube actually I just was watching videos on YouTube that I found interesting and, and there were some fantastic videos about thorium and molten salt reactors and I was just captivated. I watched hundreds of hours <laughs> and um, that filled, filled my brain up with, with knowledge. Does that count as research? <laughs> I think it totally counts as research. Like you've invested time into like learning more about something and yeah, I think it does. You know, the Hollywood picture of what a researcher looks like might be like test tubes, books, stacks of books, papers everywhere and and you know the picture of a modern researcher could be learning with a vast amount of knowledge on the internet and then going into real world talking to experts talking to other people with experiences and learning that way I think is also valuable yeah I would agree you also have to be critical about how you how you choose your yeah tutor yeah of course yeah I work in research so I my list of research projects is really long <laughs> I have a lot shorter list of sort of academic research projects I looked at batteries also our um, undergrad research project and our final yeah. year research project yeah there was actually quite a lot of little research projects in undergrad like I did one on like biofuels as a as a poster project had to understand a few academic articles and then create a post on that also did one about nuclear and something in nuclear industry you know i think it depends on the course because like our university is quite research focused yeah i think for like engineering mod if you do an engineering course there's a lot more like practical and group work and research projects that you would have to do because when you go into the real world that's what you're, you're working on. You're working on projects. Would you say the research project modules were your favourites? Uh, they were the hardest. Really? I thought they were more fun than like some of the some of the straight like learn about thermodynamics. I found that difficult. Oh yeah, thermodynamics is, is hard, but it's hard for everyone. I think it was like the research. I just remember the design project and it just being like some of the longest days of my life. Oh yeah. But I think that's the beauty of university in that there is an awful lot of breadth that you get to cover. And sometimes, especially in undergrad, it can be a sort of, it's a detailed, but it's still a surface level of understanding. And then it's whether mm. you choose to take that forwards, like you have Jasmine into further academic research, or you choose to take that into a commercial setting, like what Alice has done. So it gives you that opp opportunity. So if research yeah. is your thing, that's grand. If it's not, it's going to last for a short amount of time. You'll learn a load of things. And then you can go and do something you might prefer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would agree. I think the other thing about university is it, it is important whilst you're studying that you understand what you're studying. But it's also an opportunity to learn how to study because a lot of things when you're when you start working won't necessarily be on what you studied or yeah. because it's like Sophie said, just the surface level. You don't have to dive really deep and you're like, I have to learn this and I don't have a lecture anymore. <laughs> yeah, then re good research skills really come in handy. Yes. It's true. And I think that whilst I loved a lot of modules that we did at university, some of the most useful ones was, I can't quite remember what it was called, but it was something like additional skills. And it was an entire module that we had, which it taught you how to write your CV. It spoke to you about your interview techniques. It was it was basically like life skills, and that was part wow. of our degree module. So it was it's not quite a pass fail, but it was a compulsory unit. And at the time, I think we were doing it maybe in second year, so that if you were applying for a graduate job, you'd you'd done the module. Um, and at the time, it was a oh, I don't really understand why this is relevant. But when you get to the point of doing all of those things, you think that's that's really awesome because it's helped me along the way. So. I would maybe look into whether your university does that as well because I found that really valuable. Yeah, that was really true. I like I so I co-supervise MSc students and some final year students on their projects, and I find it really interesting 
just like their journey through learning research skills because they kind of like start off like kind of knowing what they're doing but then by the end they're like they're really confident in like their independent research skills so I find it really interesting just seeing that what's the word development development yeah that's the word Someone is asking if it's smart to go straight into a master's if they know exactly what they want to do, or is it better to do a bachelor's and then pick your master's afterwards? Yeah, I started MEng computing and then I failed maths in the first year and um, had to resit maths uh, during the summer holidays. And I failed my resit and I got uh, kicked out and and I had to then reset all my exams the following year finally passed that time and I got back in but I was downgraded to the B eng mm. um so I, I I walked away from university with a B eng not an M eng um but it doesn't really answer the question but it was an interesting uh just life story that um you know if, if, I, I I I I got top grades in in uh secondary school and what I found quite challenging was I got into Imperial, which is one of the top universities, and I went from being this in the top at the top of the class in my secondary school to being quite close to the bottom <laughs> at Imperial, and I found that quite challenging. And um, as a bit of an aside, but uh, if you stick at it, you know, I, I I managed to pass my maths and I, I managed to get my degree and uh, and everything. But that. Yeah. As to whether you choose a master's or a bachelor's, I guess um, if if you're if you're certain about what you want to do um, and, and you're happy to commit the time, then I guess getting a master's is good. But if you are not sure where you want to go, then I guess doing the bachelor's first does give you that flexibility. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you're doing a master's, can you decide halfway through to do a bachelor's? Yeah, of course you can. You can like swap down also to add on like what are your reasons for wanting to do a master's because for most jobs like a bachelor's is perfectly fine you only really want to do a master's either if there's a specific job that you want and that requires you to have like some kind of postgraduate education or you're just like really interested in learning more into a certain area those are the only reasons that I know people to do MSCs based on the MSC students that I've co-supervised there's also the, the option of um of doing a year in industry or a year abroad, which are some really yeah. fantastic things that you can do. And some of those count towards your master's, some of them don't. Um, so it's definitely worth looking at each specific university. Yeah, before we move on to another question, just to add to the master's or bachelor's debate, there is a slight difference um, between integrated master's and an MSc. It's The difference is three months of study, but it results in a different qualification. The MEng is only really recognised in the UK. Other countries don't really recognise it as a master's, it's a bachelor's. Your first degree cannot be a master's. So we were going to talk about what would we do differently. Would you change what you've done to get to where you are? Me personally? Uh, no. <laughs> it's pointless having regrets in life. I, I'm, I'm always a forward thinker, so I, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything, but I would definitely have done a bit more interrogation into apprenticeships and what life outside of university might have looked like. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities there in terms of going out and working and seeing uh, like firsthand almost what what those what you could do. So I think that's quite an exciting prospect. But no, I wouldn't change anything. Tony, what about you? Anything you would do differently? I didn't always get where I wanted to go the first time, but um, equally I think if I went back, I'd probably still have wanted to explore that option. So, you know, in that sense, I learned something on the journey. So, no, I, I also wouldn't really uh, change much. So None of us would change anything. I guess we just have positive outlook. <laughs> it's true. Whilst we didn't want to change anything, would there be advice you would give to your past self? A bit of concrete advice would be just have a look at LinkedIn. That is sort of the best place where you're going to find out about future jobs future connections, um, if you can, view it as a sort of digital CV. So anything that you do, share it, because you can always come back to it in a few years and think, oh, I'm really proud of that, or, you know, and it's a good reference point. So that would be a bit of practical advice, I'd say. So um, sign up to that. And then outside of that, I would just, it's really hard when you're looking at your A-levels. I would personally, just as an aside, say that the A-levels are the hardest things I've ever done when you get to uni I did find it easier so if you can stick in there 
honestly, you, you will get through it. Um, but just try not to take it too seriously, I would say. It's do your best and try your hardest, but things will work out okay. Yeah, I echo that. I really totally agree. For me, I think some advice to my former self would be um, about uh, maintaining relationships and building up relationships because um, life is all about relationships and, and, and getting jobs is about that. And I, I was quite shy when I was younger and I, 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 I didn't maintain relationships over time. So I'm not in touch with anyone from that I went to university with, for example. And I, I, <clears throat> I'm much better at it now. And I've actually read books on like how to win friends and influence people and, and things like that. And I, I've worked at being more charismatic and um, becoming less shy and, and things like that. And I think those soft skills um, people often overlook and they're quite important uh, because being likable in a job interview is quite important because you, you're more likely to get the job if the interviewer um, you know, resonates with you. And that can be as simple as just asking them about them and their interests and taking a genuine interest in them. And so, yeah, I, I would have said to my former self, try and try and learn uh, people skills and those soft skills and, and, and don't overlook them. Yeah. My advice was just not everyone else has the answers. So it's OK to ask other people, but also not feel too pressured if you don't have the answer immediately. I think there's a lot of, you know, because we go through schooling with uh, answer every question, make sure you tick every box in the exam. But in life, um, everyone's just kind of trying to work it out. Um, you don't have to pretend like you know everything and be comfortable with that. Be comfortable that you don't know everything and there is probably a way that you can learn. Um, and yeah, like Alistair says, relationships are really important for that as well. So we've talked a lot about our different experiences, why we chose what we studied at university, what impact it's had on what we do today and what we would have changed, if anything, and we didn't want to change anything. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for listening and uh, we hope to speak to you in another episode. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.